the worst Mora that I've ever seen. That is not an exaggeration. I'll almost bet. I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd bet that it's the worst Mora you've ever seen. A beautiful Mora carbon bushcraft model. <laughs> it has had a rough life sent in by its owner who fully takes responsibility and admits that he was not able to get it back. And of course, I respect that. The giving in and letting someone take care of it, that's fine. Admit when you're at your limit or out of your depth. And you are not alone, my friend. I get a lot of knives in here to sharpen. And uh, although this is the worst Mora I have seen, most mores actually that come to me are, are fairly new, barely used. But uh, although this is the worst more I've seen, it's far from the worst nice knife I've seen. But this knife has a number of issues, and I want to teach you guys how to address the problem when you get a knife like this. Perhaps you got a used knife from a buddy. Maybe you've bought a used knife at a flea market that's in rough shape, or perhaps your knife has gotten like this from improper sharpening by you, and you just you're unsure at this point what to do, how to get it back. So right here we have three standard Mora blades with two different issues here. So this represents the original Scandi growing. Notice nice and even, similar depth, a pretty similar depth of bevel all the way along, primary bevel. Now this knife right here has been improperly sharpened and steel has been removed in excess here in the shaded region. So that would represent steel that's gone. So imagine that's not there. This recurve is most common. I see this a lot and I have to address that issue. It doesn't need to happen, but it does happen a lot. The knife we have right now has this issue. We have an ex excess of steel removed up here, right up closer to the toe of the knife. That's where it gets most shallow. So how would I address these issues? Because I would address them differently. What I do with a knife like this is because for me a recurve is not okay. Usually if I get any knife in with a recurve, I correct it. What I would do here, because the steel is removed closer to the back, I would put in a sharpening notch. I would cut in like this and I would re-bevel the knife up as far as I needed to to give us a new straight edge just like that a new beautiful straight edge then of course I would have to put a new bevel on the knife now you can blend in you can keep the length so you could blend in to the original edge like that you would just have a more shallow belly and then the customer can take this knife home and now he can start learning to sharpen with a nice straight bevel and he can keep that clean. The only difference in how I would handle this knife is the angle I would put on here. I will still add a sharpening notch, a very small one just like this, because we still have most of our steel left back here near the heel of the blade. What I will do here to give us the most blade possible is I will choose this angle. So it'll be almost more of a Puko style blade. We will reprofile that bevel now so it walks up like this. So it's going to be a little bit more of a Puko shape. That's going to give us a lot more steel left here because there's no reason to keep it straight unless the customer requests it. There's no reason to remove all the steel in this scenario. We would have to chomp out all of this good quality steel. There's no need to do that. I'm going to choose this type of reprofiling. This may be a little bit exaggerated, but I'm going to choose that type of system, the correction, for this knife right here. In this most shallow region right here, See that? Almost full depth here. Really carved in up here. We've lost all of this curvature here. So we're going to carve this bevel up here. So now the first step here is to add that small sharpening notch. The reason you want to do that is it will make 
get easier to reprofile this bevel. Because Mora runs these bevels right up to the handle, they're actually ground before the handles are put on, um, it's going to be really difficult to reprofile that and not destroy up against the frame here. So we will add a little sharpening notch which will just step our work out a little bit from the handle and that will make things, well it'll allow us to have more even work. We'll have a little bit of a plunge line there and it should be nice and clean and it'll make it easier for the owner to sharpen going forward as well. Don't forget your eye protection. I see so many videos, I watched just one today where a guy was using, a, I don't know if it was a, a circular saw or an angle grinder or something didn't have even safety glasses on. I really like these beautiful DeWalt's I picked up recently. They're so comfortable on the face. I'll even put on ear protection. Now you can do this job on whetstones, and we are going to do some work on the whetstones today, but this knife has been really badly um, sharpened. Here we have a completely convex stubby grind, so it would take quite a bit of time to do this on the stones. You can see, let's do our, let's do our light test here right now. I'm going to tip this up until the light disappears. Right there. So we have a very steep grind. We want to bring that back somewhere like here. Yeah, that's very steep. So basically all you'd want to do is a flat stone will gradually start to correct this if you can hold your bevel close enough. It will pick up the ends. You will grind away the ends until you see the middle here starting to touch the, the deepest hollow of your recurve. Now being a knife maker, I have access to a beautiful grinder here. So I'm going to make much shorter work of this. I'm going to grind in that bevel, start it off with my belt grinder, reprofile, and then we can move to the stones and do the finish work. And we'll show you how we repair this Mora Carbon. So I thought I'd stop and show you there right now where we're at. See my grinder passes? Nice clean top plunge line here now, right up to my sharpening joy. You see we've started to cut that down back here. We've reached an apex. But look at what that recurve is doing. This is what happens when you get on your whetstones and you've established uneven curves and things, and like right here. It's almost impossible to get a good edge on your whetstone. I've done a little bit more work on this side so far but still see a few spots right there even though nice flat grind there are parts there where we've formed a burr and even gone past where we have a burr lapping over there are spots that just aren't touching because such a strong recurve and this is the problem you run into when you do this with your blades you want to try to keep nice planar surfaces you don't want dips and waves and recurves because it's going to make your sharpening job almost impossible. Now we have had to remove a fair amount of steel on this knife, but as you can see, it looks more right now, even with all that steel removed, than it did before. So now that we've reprofiled this knife edge, and as I've already said, you could have done this on the stones, it just would have taken a while because this was a severely misshapen mora bevel. We're going to start from right here, this coarse grit belt grind. Once you get to this point, you start working on your stones. And I'm going to start here with a beautiful Kuramaku Blue Black, which has quickly become one of my favorite stones. And don't forget our Nanawa Nagura. Since my last sharpening video, have you picked up one of these? Heavily recommended by me. You can buy both of these at paulsfinest.com. Fantastic. But this really just helps strip the surface of your stone, reveal a whole bunch of new 
fresh cutting particle. Remove all of the old grit and grime and steel particle there. You see there now we have a beautiful, beautiful cutting surface. One reason I really love the Kuramaku stone is this is a coarse grit stone. This is a 320 or 40. I don't see it on it and I always forget. 320 or 340 grit stone and it's a splash and go. Isn't that incredible? So a scandy grind is actually a fairly easy knife to work on the stones because the whole bevel should be in contact with the stone at once. If you want to figure out how to find that bevel, lay your knife flat on the stone, tip it up until it sits on its bevel. Now the easiest way I find to make sure it stays there is to put my thumb on that bevel and drive it into the stone. If you're using your thumb and driving that bevel into the stone, it makes it difficult for your knife to tip back off of that bevel. So lots of weight. You can just start working your blade now at this point. I won't do usually with Scandi, especially one that needs a bunch of work like this one does. I won't do full length passes. At least starting off, I'll do partial passes like this and work different parts of the blade. So I might spend a little bit of time working on the flats as you can see here now and I won't keep changing my angle and going up to that sweep up front. I'll work the flats heavily and then maybe I'll spend a little bit of time at the tip. Maybe I'll start working down around like this. Again I always keep lots of weight down low on the bevel. If you keep up high you're gonna have a tendency to be convexing off of that uh, that primary bevel there. Don't want to do that. Lots of weight down low. Keep this hand driving down into your edge. This will make sure that you're not uh, that you're not riding back and convexing as well. And once you get established on the stone and you start really creating that nice flat surface, it becomes easier and easier to stay there because that flat stone just wants to, or that flat bevel just wants to lock onto your stone. Doesn't want to come off. The stone is going to get a workout today, but the beautiful Shapton ceramic can handle a good workout. And it is a, a fast cutting stone, very high performing. Just really, really like it. Looking good. Our goal here now is to remove all the scratches from the grinder and establish a good flat stone edge. Even at 320 or 40 grit, this stone is going to give a much finer surface than our grinding belt gave. Here we have a real heavy slurry. Some people will like to keep and use that. I don't like too much of a slurry on there. I'll try to clean it up. See how some fresh water just to help to drive a lot, a lot of that mud off of there. Lots of pressure here. Lots of pressure. So right now I've got a pretty even burr all the way around, all the way along my edge, and I've established a pretty even scratch pattern from this stone. So what I like to do now, and this is what I do with pretty much any sharpening I do, I clean my stone up so all of the metal particles off of there, and I've removed any inclusions of metal particle or anything like that. So you see my stone is beautifully clean here now, almost like a brand new stone. That Nanoa helps you get there during sharpening, otherwise it's very difficult. So what I'll do now is I'll lay my knife back on the stone and I'll do some full passes, single cutting strokes only. 
making sure to stay right up to that apex. So lots of pressure forward now, and this will just help remove that burr. Because we're really concentrating on that apex now. We were doing forward and back strokes all along. Now at this point, I'll pull out a trick that I talked to you guys about a long time ago, years ago. I will pull out a piece of scrap wood, since we're working this stone, or this knife real hard on a coarse stone. A piece of scrap wood. We'll just do a couple draws through a piece of wood. And this is called, or can be called, jointing the edge. And we're just stripping any wire burr off of that edge. And if you were to compare before and after doing this, on a microscope, you would probably see a difference. You would probably see any little strands of fine wire or things like that pulled off. I wouldn't normally do it that much, but I'm just doing it here, just showing you guys and feeling what's happening to that edge. And it's a lot less, uh, there's a lot less silliness there, little grabs and, and hanging fibers. If you can see it on a microscope, I've shown it before, you can really see. But that is a nice hard edge there now. And after doing that, I'm just going to clean my stone back up. We've removed most of that burr. I'm just going to do a few more single cutting stroke passes just to further clean up and fix up that edge. The edge you're left with here now is actually a really grabby edge. You're able to stop and just use that edge, but it's a little bit too coarse for my liking. Even though it's got a lot of bite and it would make a great meat cutting knife or something plenty of sharp for butchering there now, we want to go a bit finer. So I'm going to put aside the beautiful Karamaku and take out our Shapton glass 1000. Now you'll notice, look at the stone, how dirty it is from the last time using. And this can be a little bit difficult to get off without that Nanawa Nagura. I'll give it a little rinse. This is a splash and go stone. I'll get my Nagura on there and I'll just scrub this stone down. You see how quickly it just mills away all that old junk on there. Make sure we have a nice fresh slate here. Now I don't want any of that Nagura particle left on my stone, so a good rinse here. Look at that. Now that is a nice slab of stone to sharpen on. Now let's use the exact same process. Let's get our stone hair fixed in our Nanoa stone holder. Lay our bevel nice and flat on the stone, lots of weight. Now we're going to go back into those forward and reverse strokes like we started with before on the Kuramaku. Again, notice I'm not doing full pass strokes at this point because there's so much bevel to cover. I like just working part of the bevel at a time, that is until I get closer to the end. I'm going to work in all parts of my stone so I don't have as much work to do with flattening later. Helps keep your stone flat. The same finishing process, wash up our stone, clean it up with that Nagura. A few draws through a wood block just to joint the edge. And now some single stroke, single cutting stroke passes, full passes with an emphasis or a lean into our edge. Rolling that pressure down into my edge. Beautiful. So what we're looking for now is a nice even 1000 grit scratch pattern with a right to our apex and we can feel that lots of bite
So let's have a look at what our edge looks like here off of that 1000 shaft. You can see quite impressive. We have some reflection there. Not a lot, of course, it's a 1000 grit. But this is a very harsh biting edge there now. This would be inc an incredible butcher's edge. Let's see what else we can do here. This 2000 Aotoshi is a beautiful polishing grit. We have a 5000, 10,000, 12,000. We have a 3000 Nanowatt. This 3000 Nanowatt Superstone is actually a beautiful polishing stone. I think I'm going to work this one and show you guys the results. I haven't used this stone in a little while. Beautiful solid brick. Another splash and go stone. Although a little bit more thirsty, I would say, than the Shackton Ceramic. Give this one a scrub down too, a little bit dirty. And once I take my stones out of storage, I do like to clean them up. Just because sometimes you get a little fuzz of mildew or little particles of dust on there. You want a fresh, clean stone. Splash and go stones like this are so nice because you can get right to work. Rinse and repeat. Let's do the same thing again. I'll work parts of my blade. Then I'll finish with full passes. I do find that this Nanoa Superstone here is a little bit soft. So, you want to be careful because you can hack into this stone fairly easily, I find. You can kind of chomp in, especially you lean a little bit off to one side and you hack into a corner. It's just the way the compound is. Take little gouges out of your surface. It doesn't make it a bad stone, it's just something to be aware of when using. Every stone has kind of its own little quirks and behaviors, a little bit different compound, likes to be used in a little different way. You kind of build a relationship with your stone. And now a strap here, we're going to do a few passes. We finish on that 3000 the exact same way we did on the other couple stones and that was with a fresh clean stone, full cutting stroke passes with an emphasis down towards that edge. Not really enough to convex the edge, but enough to be sure you're right up on that apex. Because something I've struggled with, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have as well. In fact, I know you have, just because I tend to get a lot of emails, people saying, you know, I'm sharpening and sharpening this knife. I can't get it right. What am I doing wrong? And they'll, I'll say, send me some close-up pictures of your bevel, things like that. When we get down to the bottom of it, I can clearly see they're sharpening right up to the apex and just not quite getting there. If you were to put it on the microscope, there is just a hair, not even a hair, just such a small amount of distance between where they're filing and the actual apex. So they're sharpening and sharpening and they, they've created a beautiful bevel, nice and polished, really handsome, but they've never actually <laughs> touched the apex and it's easy to do. That's why I remind you guys to put that emphasis right up. It'll kind of lean into your edge a little bit. And here's our edge off of that 3000 grit Nanowatt Superstone and a little bit of stropping. It is not an absolutely perfect mirror polish. You can see there's some smudges and hazing. You could spend a lot, a lot of time on this bevel and get this just perfect. But it would be nothing, it would be for nothing 
but aesthetic purposes. And I get some people want that. But this owner does not want this. This owner wants this knife corrected. Didn't even ask for a polish like this. He asked for a good working edge once again that he could start proper and learn to maintain. And we've saved this beautiful Mora knife, this carbon, this bushcraft model, so they can do that. So thank you guys for watching another video here at the sharpening sink. I really appreciate it. I hope you learned something from this video. Oh, look at that. Hope you learned something this video, found some value in it. I hope you were at least entertained. Thank you guys for watching. Leave a comment down below. If you have a sharpening question or you want to ask me a question about what I did here today, or if there's a knife you want to see sharpened, I'll do my best to get it for you. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if it's your first time here. We'll see you in the next video.